Coming in at number 10, we have Aaron Rolston. This is the real man who the movie 127 Hours is based off of. This guy was hiking through the Blue John Canyon and he lost his footing and went tumbling down a crevasse. But when he did, a boulder came loose and came down on his arm. This pinned him in the canyon and now he was stuck. He thought his best course of action would be to wait for someone to come help him. It was only a matter of time before he was found. Well, he waited for five days and he was going through every last granola bar and water pack that he had. Eventually, it was clear that he was not going to be safe and he had one of two choices, either die from dehydration or cut his arm off and maybe die from blood loss, but that would be his only chance at survival. Turns out cutting off his arm was the right move. It wasn't an easy process though. Not that any of you at home would think that cutting off your own arm would be an easy process. First, he had to break his arm and then he had to take out a pocket knife and cut through all of the meat and tendons. This left him with a bloody stump for an arm and then he had to trek his way out of the wilderness to find help as he was bleeding out. It's moments like this that make you understand how powerful the human body is and what we are able to accomplish when we really push ourselves to our limit. Coming at number nine, we have Natalia Pasternak. Natalia Pasternak came face to face with a brown bear who wanted her dead. She was walking through the forest in Siberia with a friend and then all of a sudden her dog started to act up. There was clearly something very close. It was a brown bear. The bear quickly killed the dog and then beelined it straight for Natalia. Her friend tried to find off the bear, but the lady that Natalia was with was 80 years old, so she didn't really have the strength to take down a bear. Once this woman realized that she was no match for the bear, she took off to go get the police while Natalia was left behind being tossed around by this massive beast. The bear thought it had killed Natalia, and something that bears will do will bury something they've killed so they can come back to eat it later. Eventually, Natalia's friend and the police came back to find Natalia buried but still alive. She was taken to the hospital and survived. This lady is tough as nails. And guys, don't forget to hit that like button. It really helps us out. Coming in at number eight, we have Anna Williams. This young woman was nearly killed by the infamous BTK killer back in 1979. This is a horrific story. Dennis Rader, who is more famously known as the BTK killer, had picked Anna as his next victim. He knew her place inside and out and had been watching her for probably around three months. Late one night, he broke into her home, disabled her phones, and then he waited in the darkness for her to arrive. But she never did. Anna was out at a party and she never came home that night. Eventually, the BTK killer left. Anna came home to find her house broken into and then later got a letter from the deranged man that was a poem about the night that he broke into her home and stayed up late waiting for her to come back. That is terrifying. Coming in at number seven, we have Anna Bagaholm. Anna Bagaholm was stuck in freezing water for so long, they had to use a machine to heat up her blood to bring her back to life. Unless you're Wim Hof the Iceman. I don't feel the cold, I feel the power. Not all of us can withstand that kind of cold temperature, but Anna Bagaholm absolutely did. She was skiing in Norway and lost control and went to a river. Obviously getting wet while it's freezing outside is bad for your health, but you'll probably be able to get bundled up and return back to normal after a little bit of hot cocoa. Well, Anna was in a tough situation. She was actually wedged under the ice. Her friends had to come and rescue her and it took them 80 minutes to get her out of the height. Normally if a person's core body temperature drops below 80, they will die. But Anna was strong enough to make it to the hospital and as I said before, they used a machine to reheat her blood because at this point her body was so cold it was legally dead. Only 10% of people are able to survive this procedure and she was able to come out of this alive. Coming in at number six, we have Caleb Whitby. Caleb would get in one of the most horrific car accidents you can imagine and walk away without a mark on his body. He was driving home from work and collided with a semi that was in the same lane as him. This caused him to lose control of his car. The semi and him both swerved into the oncoming lane and then another semi coming in his direction smashed into them. The two semis sandwiched Caleb in his car and caused a huge multi-car pileup. Paramedics arrived on the scene along with the police and firefighters and after the dust had settled, they realized that trapped in his car like a little kid down a well was Caleb. He couldn't move. All he could do was yell for help. It took them six hours, but eventually they were able to cut him free from his car and pull him out. And once he was free, he might have been a little stiff from being cramped in there for so long, but he had zero injuries. That is insane. He was packed in a car, tied
tighter than a hot dog gets packed in Joey Chestnut's stomach. Coming in at number five, we have Melvin Roberts. How many times is too many times to get hit by lightning? Well, once should be enough, but how about 11 times? Melvin Roberts has been hit by a bolt from Zeus more times than I have won a crown at Fall Guys. This guy is literally a lightning rod. I mean, the list is supposed to be about lucky people who survive, but getting hit by lightning 11 times sounds like the worst luck of all time. But it is good luck that he's been able to survive all of this. He's been hit so many times, he knows how food tastes after you get hit by lightning. He talked about how getting hit by lightning makes everything have this sulfur taste because the lightning will cook your body from the inside side out. His insides must not be a very happy place. There's even a time where Melvin got hit by lightning when it was sunny out. That seems like it should be a crime against nature, but so far this dude keeps on ticking. He's 62 years old and might have a few lightning strikes left in him before he kicks the bucket. Coming at number four, we have a day in a volcano. Now this sounds like it would be a sweet little getaway for a lava monster, but this was a horror story from Michael Benson who had to live through this while he was shooting the movie Silver. Michael Benson and Chris Duddy were getting some aerial shots from a helicopter when things started to take a turn for the worse. The helicopter lost control and after a series of maneuvers, the two of them had to exit and were standing inside of a volcano in Hawaii. Chris was a little bit of a younger dude and more acrobatic and he was able to climb out of the volcano and then took off to go get help. Michael was stuck in there with a pool of lava bubbling below him, waiting for his body to fall in and get turned into a soup. On top of this, the intense heat was threatening to knock him unconscious and there was a ton of fumes that were constantly billowing out of this bad boy. At any moment, he could have passed out. But right when things seemed that they were too far gone, after this dude had spent a day in a volcano, he was rescued. Coming in at number three, we have Ron Hunt. You think if a drill went through your eye and into your skull, it would be instant death. Well, Ron Hunt must have a brain made out of Teflon because he walked away from this one without any brain damage. I remember seeing this story on TV when I was a kid. It was back in 2003, and Ron Hunt was working as a consultant construction worker. He was about six feet off the ground using a ladder. At one point he started to feel the ladder wobble and it was pretty clear that he was about to head straight down towards the earth. He threw the drill but ended up landing right where the drill was going to land. The drill went into his head and through his eye and out the back of his head. He was extremely lucky because the drill bit moved his brain out of the way. After everything was said and done, Ron lost his eye but had zero brain damage. Coming in at number two we have a Imagine being stuck in the middle of the Sahara Desert, your car just crapped out, and you barely have any supplies left. This is the sticky situation that Emil Loray got himself into. He was a French tourist who worked his way down to Morocco for one reason, and that was to take his little car and zip around off-roading in the sands of the Sahara Desert. Well, he did this, but his car broke down, and he was quickly burning through all of his supplies. He realized that if he was going to try and walk back, he would die, so he started to scrap his car for parts and made a makeshift motorcycle and rode it back to the city and survived. Coming in at number one, we have Friend Salak. Friend Salak has been killed nearly seven times and survived every single one of them, and then he won the lottery. This guy is probably the luckiest man who has ever lived. Yeah, well... You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. But hear me out. The first time this guy almost died, he was 33 years old, and he was on a lovely train ride. The train derailed and crashed into a lake. A bunch of people were killed, 17 to be exact. But Fren is strong like bull, and he walked away without a scratch. And that wouldn't even be close to the end of his problems with transportation. While flying on a plane, the door would blast open, and Fren would get sucked out of the plane and fall to the earth. He would land on a haystack and live. The plane would crash, killing a handful of people that were on board. Later, he would be in a bus crash, a car crash, hit by a bus, and have the engine of his car blow up twice. And like I said before, this guy won the lottery and walked away with millions, and take this, he gave most of it away. This dude said life isn't about money. He kept enough to live comfortably with his wife and gave the rest of the money to all of his friends. What a legend, dude. 
All right, guys, that has been our list. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time. Starting to survive Dahmer. Now, unless you live under a rock, then you've definitely heard of the infamous serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. I also watched his documentary on Netflix, and I was pretty f***ed, I'm not gonna lie. Have you guys seen it? Let me know below. He dismembered and murdered 17 men in his run by turning his regular Milwaukee apartment into the butcher shop from Sweeney Todd. Just for a Spark Notes version for what used to go down, Jeffrey would lure his victims to his house and do every unspeakable thing under the sun, ranging from cannibalism and medical experimentation to necrophilia. But the main character of this story isn't him, it's Tracy Edwards. Jeffrey invited him over for beer and to watch The Exorcist 3, but when Tracy got there, he very quickly realized he made a grave mistake. Jeffrey forced him to get on the ground while wielding a butcher knife, talking about how he was going to carve his heart out and eat it. As the film went on, Tracy knew he was running out of time. He allowed Jeffrey to handcuff one of his wrists, and after distracting him, he managed to hit him and run outside and flagged down a police car. And obviously they then investigated his house and found four human heads in his fridge, but I mean, at least Tracy escaped and survived, so there's that. Oh, I would've just cried so hard. I would just be like, just, just kill me, just end it. End it all. Coming in at number nine is Bahia Bakari. I think this is honestly one of my worst fears come to life, so I don't even know how Bahia did it, but she did, so kudos to her. So back in June of 2009, Yemenia Flight 626 had 152 people on board it when it crashed into the Indian Ocean at about 2 a.m. Despite not wearing a life jacket or being a strong swimmer, Bahia was ejected from the plane and hung onto a bit of debris in order to survive. Apparently there were other survivors since she did hear them, but they slowly but surely started feeling away. At about 11 a.m. nine hours after the crash, she was found by a civilian vessel that had been hired to look for the remains of the crash and for any possible survivors. She was the only one who survived it, coming away with just a broken collarbone, fractured pelvis and more. Which given the context is a lot less than I thought it would be. Just saying. Oh, can you imagine? Like my worst, I'd rather crash on land than crash in the water. Like I cannot be in the ocean. I cannot. The sharks will get me if the plane crash hasn't already. At number eight, we have Buried Alive. Now, usually if you think your relationship isn't going well or you think you're low-key just tired of your partner, the logical next step is usually just to break up with them. But that was not what Marcine Kaspshak chose to do. Marcine's relationship with his fiance Mikalina Lewandowska was going down the drain, and so he hatched a plan to get rid of her. He, along with his friend Patrick, attacked her with a stun gun, and once she was subdued on the ground for long enough, they bound her ankles and wrists and tied her up. Then since they apparently hadn't thought of what to do next, they just left her like that for hours until finally shoving her into a cardboard box and driving out into the woods. How did she not cramp up so much while in that position for hours? I would have literally, again, probably died. There and then. There, the duo buried her alive under four inches of dirt and a 90 pound tree branch. Feeling immense claustrophobia, worried for her three year old son, McLena knew she had to survive somehow. She used her engagement ring, which is, I guess, good for something, to cut through the rope and claw out of the ground after already being under for two hours. Both men involved got sentenced to 20 years each, but I feel like they should have been sentenced to life. How can you not be sentenced to life when you literally try to kill someone by burying them alive? Your fiance, no less. Snakery. Filling Adam seven slot is the Hitchhiker. This one comes from Reddit to Spazmonkey1949, who said their sister's adopted brother once picked up a hitchhiker who looked like he was in need of a lot of help. The guy got into the passenger seat, and about 10 minutes into the drive, he slit the brother's throat, kicked him out of his own car, and left him to die on the isolated country road. Thankfully, no major arteries were hit, so the brother tied his shirt around his throat and crawled to the nearest farmhouse to get help. Can you imagine having your slit throat and crawl? Falling to a farmhouse, like, I'm stunned. And I mean, they did end up catching the guy and he went to jail, so I guess it, he did live happily ever after, except, you know, having a scar and a huskier voice. Now at number six is Dad. This one was shared by Reddit user Bird's mom, 28, who said when he was six years old, he witnessed his dad stab his mother 20 times in front of him and his little brother. He then took a bunch of her blood and started rubbing it on his brother's face, saying this is your mother's blood, as their mom lay there almost dead in front of their eyes. The two managed to get to the hospital in time, which is a 
ridiculous feat to achieve for a six year old, and they saved her just in time. The dad was in jail for only eight years, claiming insanity, and that he had heard demons telling him to do it. I feel like it's the biggest cop out to plead insanity. I feel like that's the easiest way to get out of a sentencing. You just have to go to a psych ward for the rest of your life. Which I mean, I mean, jail is probably better than that. Coming in at number five is The Fall. Just reading this story gave me major vertigo. I was like, ugh. Now, as window washers, Alcides Moreno and his brother Edgar were more than used to the risks that came with their job, as well as the high heights they had to work at. But back in December of 2007, the rig they were on disengaged, sending both of them 47 stories down to the ground, which is about 500 feet. When firefighters got there, Edgar was long dead, but Alcides was miraculously alive and conscious. Guess are that he had somehow managed to ride the platform while falling, which slowed down his descent. I mean, he still had shattered limbs, fractured ribs, and major injuries to his brain and spine, but he did survive. Doctors were shook because surviving a fall from three stories or above is usually fatal, let alone managing to survive 47. Even when I see the window washers washing my windows, I'm just like, can you not fall? Can you not fall? Can you not fall? At number four is not dead yet. Angel Resendiz, aka the railway killer, killed 23 people across the US and Mexico during the 90s. In 1997, Holly Dunn and her boyfriend Chris Meyer were on their way home from a friend's party when they were stopped by a man asking for money by a train station. After showing them that he had an ice pick, he managed to tie them up and bring them to a ditch nearby. After checking to see whether they'd been followed, Angela proceeded to beat Chris to death with a 50 pound rock. Realizing that maybe he wanted to kill two people that night instead of one, he then raped Holly, stabbed her in the neck with the ice pick, and then beat her till she passed out. Now at this point, Angel thought she was dead, but she was very much not. When she regained consciousness, she managed to drag herself to a house, all while having a broken jaw, shattered eye socket, and a plethora of other injuries. She survived and testified against him, and he was sentenced to death. And mind you, she was the sole survivor of all of his murders, and that is saying something. Good on you, Holly Dunn. You drag yourself out of that ditch, and you testify against him. Filling out number three slot is Felix. Cartels are not a joke, people. I know their portrayals in movies and shows like Narcos are dramatized, but they're not exaggerated. You are really screwed if you end up on a cartel's hit list. Like, it's done. You are over. You are cancelled. Hashtag cancel party is you. Either way, within Mexico, the warring Zeta and Gulf cartels have killed dozens of people in their crossfire. One night, a 20 year old guy called Felix was walking home when he was picked up by a police officer and dropped off at a Zeta cartel safe house. And keep in mind, in a lot of these places, there is no law. The police help the cartel, or the cartel is the law. After being dropped off, he spent the next week being pistol whipped, beaten, and shocked while they called his family demanding a ransom. The cartel went as far as to torture and kill Gulf cartel members in front of him, and eventually his family managed to wire them $5,000, but obviously it wasn't enough. They demanded double. In the following months, he was shipped from safe house to safe house, getting beaten and regularly until one day he was beaten to a pulp and left for dead on the street. But thankfully, he actually survived. Go Felix. Now at number two are the snow tracks. This one's from Reddit to Laundry Soap who shared this story on behalf of her boyfriend's mum. Growing up, the mum lived in a weirdly designed house, meaning there were doors leading to the outside all over the house, including in her bedroom. She started feeling unsafe in the house like she was being watched, and honestly, with that many entry points, I would have been sh it as well. Her parents brushed her off as her being afraid of the dark, even though she insisted she'd heard her door not being rattled from the outside. Things got so bad to the point she'd wake up screaming every night and started sleeping in her parents' room. One night, the dad went to use the bathroom and saw a shadowy figure move down the hallway and the noise of footsteps. Nah, honey, you ain't dreaming. He searched the house and found nothing until the next morning. Leading up to every window and door were fresh footprints in the snow outside. It was clear that someone had really been trying to get into the house, and after following the prints, they led the dad to a house where a mentally disturbed teenager lived. The boy admitted he would enter the house every single night and just watch the girl sleep. Like, imagine if that had progressed, then he probably would have raped her or killed her or kidnapped her. Imagine being watched every night and you know you're being watched and your parents still believe you. That's a scary situation. 
that just happened. Finally, at number one is 24 hours. In Feb of 2006, five year old Jake Fink Bonker was playing in a league basketball game when he was pushed from behind and split his lip open on the base of the hoop. Now, normally that wouldn't have been a big deal, except the surface of the hoop had the bacteria strep A on it, which is actually a flesh eating bacteria. Within hours, the doctors told Jake and his parents that he was most likely going to die because the bacteria was literally eating his face and it was just spreading so fast from his lips to everywhere else. And Usually this bacteria doesn't stop spreading until the person is dead. Most patients die with a day of diagnosis, but somehow the infection slowed and stopped. The family believe it was because they prayed to Blessed Kateri Takakawitha, a Mohawk Indian, and she performed the miracle that saved him. Starting us off, number 10, we have a man who was out at sea for 13 months and survived. Is this real life right now? With just a few basic necessities and an empty ice chest, Jose Alvaranga managed to survive for over over one year at sea by himself. He was a very experienced fisherman and he knew his way around the ocean. But even the most experienced people are no match for the strength of a tropical storm. Just a few hours into his journey, a storm hit him and it lasted for five days. It was impossible to steer the boat and he had lost all of his directions. He had no idea which way was what. He survived on a diet of raw fish, turtles, small birds, sharks, and rainwater. I don't know how he caught a shark. Well, after 438 days, he managed to swim to a small island where two locals found him naked clutching a knife and shouting in Spanish. He was treated in a hospital before he was reunited with his family in El Salvador. He's the first person in recorded history to be able to survive at sea for over one year on a small boat. A record you really don't want. The man who is forced to drink blood in the desert takes us to number 9. Moro Prosperi enrolled to participate in a 6 day race through the Sahara Desert. That sounds awful and I'm not sure why anyone would go out of their way you know, to sign up for such an intense race, but that's what he decided to do. Well unfortunately, a sandstorm caused Prosperi to take shelter and camp out for the rest of the night, but when he woke up, he was very disoriented and he realized that... He's lost in the desert. Unknowingly, he started to travel in the wrong direction, where he eventually stumbled across a Muslim shrine. He ran out of food and water within the first 24 hours, so he had to drink his own pee. But once he got to the shrine, he saw bats there and decided to drink their blood in order to quench his thirst. So he drank the blood of 20 bats over the course of three days. And when he didn't see any signs of being rescued, he tried to take his own life. Mm -hmm. okay, evidentemente. C'è qualcosa, forse riesco a salvarmi. I'm glad he was able to push his limits in order to persevere and survive. He is truly an inspiration. Number eight, we're talking about a woman who survived 42 days without food. I mean, wow, that is actually super impressive. I can't even survive 12 hours without food. Helen Glavin was 21 years old at the time, and she was trying to travel between Fairbanks and Seattle. She decided to save some money and fly with an amateur pilot. I have no idea why anyone would decide to do that. It turned out to be a horrible mistake. Well, obviously, clearly, because their plane crashed on February 4th, 1963. They landed in the remote part of the Canadian Canadian wilderness, but thankfully Clavin and the pilot managed to survive the crash landing. But they didn't have any survival supplies. They only had matches and a few cans of sardines. The future of them seemed pretty bleak. A week went by and they completely ran out of food. All they have left to survive was melted snow. They were both overweight so they can survive off their own body fat and they were able to survive for the next 42 days until a plane finally spotted them. Trapped under the World Trade Center for 27 hours comes in at number seven. This story is remarkable. On September 11, 2001, Janelle Guzman McMillan, well, she was working in her office in the World Trade Center when she heard an explosion outside. As she raced down the stairs, she can literally feel the building starting to collapse around her. So for the next 27 hours, she was pinned underneath the rubble at ground zero until a rescue dog was able to save her. I was just begging and pleading with God to, you know, show me a sign, give me a, a miracle or something. And I put my hand up and that's when Paul grabbed my hand and called me by name and told me, he's not going to let me go, I'm going to be fine. Doctors did tell her that she would never be able to walk again. Well, you know what, she is now defying all odds here because she is now walking and running. This is just an amazing story about human survival and how you can literally do anything that you set your mind to. Because surviving for 27 hours underneath a building, well, that takes a really strong mind. A car 
train come crashing onto this list at number six. A 46 year old homeless man by the name of Robert Evans, well he has had his share of bad luck. In the span of just seven hours, he was hit by a car and then he was struck by a train. Is this real life right now? First, he was involved in a hit and run when a car hit him while he was riding his bike. He was immediately rushed to the hospital where he was treated for minor injuries. But after being released from the hospital the same day, he was hit by a train as he was crossing the tracks with his bike. I mean, that bike is just so bad luck. He was thrown in the air and he fell 10 feet into a creek below him. He was lucky in the sense that he didn't suffer from serious injuries, but to top it all off, he was given a ticket for trespassing because the bridge that he was trying to cross on is a restricted area. I mean, come on, can't this poor guy catch a break? He should have been given a lifetime supply of train tickets or, or maybe a new bike, one that's not cursed. Number five, we're talking about a woman who woke up from a 20 year coma. Sarah Scantlin was only 18 years old when she suffered from a traumatic brain injury. She was hit by a drunk driver when she was thrown into oncoming traffic and she was hit again. A car likely drove over her skull and doctors said that Sarah would survive, but she would never wake up again. The damage to her brain was so extensive and they had no way of knowing is she really there or if the damage had left her in a vegetative state. But 20 years later, when all hope was lost, Sarah actually woke up. Her parents couldn't believe the news and raced to the hospital to talk to their daughter for the first time in two decades. Number four, we have a man bitten by a black mamba snake. It only takes two drops of the black mamba venom to kill a human. Their venom contains neurotoxins that slow down the nervous system and eventually paralyzes their victim. Without anti-venom, the fatality rate from a black mamba snake is 100%. So with all of that taken into consideration, how the heck did this guy survive? Well, back in 1998, Danny Pinar was a research student working in South Africa. One day he went out on an expedition, but he didn't let anyone know where he was going. That was his first mistake. He was in the water when all of a sudden he felt a sharp sting on his back of his knee. His worst nightmare was becoming his new scary reality. He knew that he was bitten by the deadly and the venomous black mamba snake, and if he had any chance of surviving, he had to move fast. He tried to race back to his car, but the venom was already taking over his body. He tried to apply a tourniquet to his leg, but he knew he was living on borrowed time. He made his way out of the jungle, hopped into his car, and raced away until he saw another car. By that time, he made it to the hospital. It had already been two hours since he was bitten, so he could no longer swallow, speak, or move. Luckily, he was able to show doctors that he was not in a coma, and they were able to give him the anti-venom. And you know what? Note to self, never travel alone in South Africa without black mamba anti-venom. I've been to South Africa, and yeah, pretty terrified. There's a lot of things that can kill you down there. And now at number three, we have a woman who was trapped under ice for 80 minutes. Anna Begenholm was skiing when she lost control of her skis and she fell head first into a layer of ice on a frozen stream. A hole opened up in the ice and her head and torso were pulled underwater. She became trapped underneath the ice, which was 20 centimeters, uh, roughly about eight inches thick. It's pretty thick. Thankfully, she was able to find an air pocket underneath the ice, but she was also battling with hyperthermia. During this time, her body temperatures dropped down to 56.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is one of the lowest surviving body temperatures in recorded history. After she was rescued by her friend, she was transported by helicopter to the nearest hospital. She woke up 10 days later and she was paralyzed from the neck down. But after months of physical therapy, she has almost made a full recovery. Number two, we have a survival story about a tsunami. A family of five were on vacation in Thailand when all of a sudden they were swept away by a massive tsunami when they were outside relaxing by the pool. They saw a huge wave bulldoze its way through the hotel and the mother was tossed through a plate glass window. After being submerged and dragged underwater for more than three minutes, she finally surfaced and clung to a tree, clinging on to dear life. She was scared, she was alone. She thought that she was going to die, but then she saw her son floating in the water, so she went to rescue him. What a hero. They were trapped in the water, grasping to a tree trunk. She was heavily bleeding, she thought this was the end for her.
her, but a Thai man rescued them and brought them to a hospital. She didn't think that the rest of her family survived, but miraculously enough, all five of them were able to survive and they were reunited. There's a lot more to this story, so if you guys want to know exactly what happened, well, they actually made a movie based on this. The movie is called The Impossible, and I'd highly recommend watching it. A horrific climbing accident comes onto this list on number one. Let's travel back to 1985, when Joe Simpson and Simon Yates decided to climb the west face of Sula Grande, which is a mountain located in Peru. Their dream quickly became a nightmare when they were hit with a devastating storm that nearly killed them. Earlier, Simpson broke his leg as they were attempting to climb down the mountain. The two hikers thought this was an immediate death sentence, but they kept on trekking down the mountain. When the blizzard came, Simpson was lowered onto an overhanging ledge, and at that point, his rope had run out. As he was dangling there, Simpson knew that eventually Yates would lose his footing and tumble past him, killing them both. Yates had to make the hardest and most impossible decision of his life. He decided to sever the rope in order to save himself. He put himself in a lot of danger to save his friend, but ultimately he had to cut the rope or else both would have died. Um, I was being pulled from the cliff. He couldn't get back up and I took a decision, as you say, to cut the rope, but... Um, my big problem was, what do I do? Um, and it was only when I remembered I got a knife that the solution to the predicament right. that I was in presented itself, I suppose. So Simpson plummeted into an icy cave, which looked like it would be his final resting place. But, I mean, you guys clicked on this video. Miraculously enough, three days later, he defied all odds and made it back to the base camp alive. Absolutely no idea how. What an impossible ending to that story. Mm -hmm.